All right, guys, here we go. So today's video is going to be about hedging. It's going to be about long puts. Uh, I'll explain what a hedge is. I'll explain why you need one. I'll explain how much of a portfolio one should normally use for a hedge. And then also uh, we'll be covering two of them. Uh, one is Best Buy and the other one is Starbucks. And I'll explain the methodology behind them and targets and kind of what I'm seeing from a charting perspective, what's happened historically. Uh, so it should be good stuff. I think you'll really like this one, and I, hopefully you guys will learn a lot. Here's, here's a hedge. A hedge investment offsets the risk of adverse price movements in another investment. A perfect hedge is hard to find, but it's one that's 100% inversely correlated to the original investment. If the original investment depreciates, the hedge investment rises. Hedging is like taking out an insurance policy. The downside of hedging to reduce risk is that it often reduces potential profits as well. Suppose Rachel buys shares of a luxury goods company. Knowing its profits fall when the economy slows, she diversifies. Rachel hedges with a defensive stock such as a utility company, which isn't vulnerable to changes in the economy. If the economy tanks and the value of the luxury stocks do indeed fall, the utility stock offers some protection. But if the economy booms, Rachel may wish she had used her money to buy more luxury goods stocks rather than hedging. Derivatives are a popular instrument to hedge against an underlying asset. For example, Morty, the investor, buys 100 shares of stock PLC at $10 a piece. Morty hedges by buying a $5 put option on the stock with a strike price of $8 that expires in a year. If the stock trades above the strike price, Monty won't exercise his option. If it trades at $0, he will sell his shares at $8 each, costing him $205. Without the option, Monty stood to lose his entire investment. All right, so that last scenario is probably the more uh, the, the better example. I usually at, try and allocate maybe 5% of my portfolio towards a hedge play. You know me, I like asymmetric bets. So when I'm betting, let's say, 4x to 20x upside multipliers, it is nice to have 5% of my portfolio since I have such high upside. It's nice to have at least 5% that can be dedicated towards what happens if we go to war with China? What happens if we have a banking collapse 2008 type event? Now, I think that will be pretty well covered this time around because the concept of quantitative easing the banks being fully backed by the by the government and the fed there's just a lot of things that are different but also in 2008 everybody thought everything was going to be fine they didn't see any anything coming systemic risk right now with china not even war but systemic risk is so bad so bad their economy is plummeting we're looking at maybe four million uh, uh, bankruptcies, or I should say, no, 4 million uh, people getting kicked out of their homes in the next year. There's just, they, they've got capital outflows that are out the wazoo. There's just a ton of stuff happening in China that is problematic and that could could lead to contagion around the world. you got to remember, this is the second biggest economy in the world. It's, it's not as important as the United States. It's very manufacturer based providing goods to the rest of the world they don't have a good service based economy so contagion hopefully will be somewhat limited but there's also massive us dollars and the world is invested in this economy and there are a number of countries like in europe and other parts of the world where a lot of their business comes from china uh, even some of these examples that we're going to be looking at for our, the hedging strategy, just even with Starbucks, they're looking at 10,000 locations in China. So you can imagine if China's economy is truly deteriorating, like I believe it is, um, and or we're going to war, gosh, having 10,000 locations in China probably isn't smart. Anyway, we're going to start with our first one, uh, Best Buy. It's a classic. I don't know how many times you go there. I never go there. Um, I go there if I want to look at stuff. And then figure out how much cheaper I can get it on Amazon. Um, they've survived. Best Buy has actually done a pretty good job. When you look at revenue uh, growth year over year of eight negative eight percent, they had um, they had a big resurgence in the pandemic era. They got a little bit of the bonus, just like Amazon. Not as much, but a decent amount. You can see down below here, cash flow's got a pop. Um, net income was up. Revenue was up. 
the pandemic was good to them. It, it helped them out and gave them a little bit of a breather. And you can see Best Buy, too, was making so many changes, really getting online a lot, reducing staffing, re restructuring their stores. They did, they've done a good job trying to survive. I will give them that. And you can see this in some of their increased revenues and that income's going up. Again, I cannot shake a stick at one and a half billy for a net income. That isn't bad at all. But there's some stuff that we need to watch. We need to watch their increased debt levels. We need to note that their operating expenses have not been going down. And there's there's some other stuff. And you can see they're just doing buybacks. Like they're in, they're in coast-it mode. It's just like keep the stock up. Uh, let's see if there's any other key charts here. Again, operating leverage. The revenues are just not going anywhere. And operating expenses are not getting better. Um, let's see if there's any ratios. Revenue per employee, that's some weird data. Um, that must be some anomalies. I don't think there's anything really here I care about. Uh, oh yeah, uh, estimates going forward. You can see how estimates are starting to come down um, for EPS, EBIT, revenue. I think that pattern continues. But again, we're not looking so much at where this company is now. We're looking at what could happen to this company in a 2008-like event or just a, like a recession, a strong recession. And there is precedent for that. If we actually go back here and look at this chart, I'll zoom in a little bit and make sure you guys can see this. Uh, hopefully you can see this pretty good. So these guys actually struggled. They they were not looking good in two, December 2012. You can see from their peak in 2006, I think it was, these guys were down 81%. So Best Buy was feeling the Amazon pain. Now their stock price has continued to go up. But that's been from stock buybacks because they had a lot of cash for a long time. But as we see, cash has been drying up. And if we actually go yearly is better. If we look at yearly here, you can see how cash prevailed in the you know 2000s, early 2000s. It was great. Their cash position was wonderful. Debt was very low. And then you can see how they kind of struggled for a little bit after 2008. They had some debt. Their debt was higher than their cash in 2012. Again, they were getting crushed by Amazon. They did a bunch of stuff to try and refine, lower costs, just get online, and things got a little bit better. But you can see how, despite the pandemic in 2020, just really boosting revenue a lot, their debt is going up, and they've bought back a ton of shares. And with debt going up and potentially in an economic crisis, net income going negative, which I think it would do this time. It didn't do that in 2008. In 2008, Best Buy was like the place to be. You still shopped there. Um, you still bought most of your most of your electronic goods there. At least a lot of people did. Amazon hadn't destroyed and ate up as much of their market share by that time. They were still more of like we do books and other stuff, but people just it wasn't the same. It wasn't the the just monopoly it is today, but it is today. And Best Buy struggles to compete. You look at three year profit growth. Look at this negative forty eight percent. There's just it's a dying company. It's a dying company. Um, the business model could get crushed in an economic downturn. And and also, too, if we get like a war with China and economic goods, if goods get shut down, these guys get hurt. A lot of electronic devices come from China nowadays or that region. So a war would be just destructive to this stock. I can't imagine how quickly it would crush it. Way worse than 2008. Way worse. And in 2008... Again, in that period of like peak S&P to the trough of 2008 was about a year for these guys. They lost 70%. So keep that in mind, right? So right now, a technical pattern here. I'm just going to zoom out or zoom up a little bit and try and make this. This is very left shoulder, head, right shoulder, getting ready to break down. They've gotten a little bit of a reprieve here recently just because the market's been doing well. But if we're making the assumption with 5% of our portfolio that, hey, we're worried about the future and we're worried about, you know, another recession, um, potentially a really big one. If you look at the fear mongers, again, there's a lot of things that scare us uh, and, and there's some legitimacy to some of it. I'm going to make another video here that talks about, I made one about macro a couple of days ago that was more on the positive side. I'm going to make another one that's on the negative side. I want you guys to be able to weigh the good and the bad and think about this. Personally, I don't mind taking 5% of my portfolio and allocating it towards a hedging strategy where I pray the money goes away, especially when I'm giving myself two years for it to play out. 
and I'm working with dying companies or companies that have way too much overseas exposure and debt. Um, and I think both of these plays are going to be that. So here, again, left shoulder, head, right shoulder, waiting to break down. You can see where it got to the dot 618. I've got this green support line. Doesn't Does not look good for this stock. Um, does not look good for this stock. Now, if we break down, let's pretend we're in a recession. Again, we lost 70% in a year. So looking at this right here and saying that we're going to 38 or right about here, this is where we start to hit key support. Like not at the 200, that's actually not even that great for this company. The measured move would be at least to the 38 zone for this head and shoulders pattern. And honestly, it can go down to 25, 26. So, but, but let's just say, let's say that we get down into like this 72% range because this company is just not set up well like it was before. Or again, there's daily gap fills. So let's say that we go down to 35. Now, I've already covered the options on this one. You guys know how to do this stuff. Watch my options 101 video if you don't. Um, you pull up the options chain first. I'm looking at January 2026 because I want to look at coverage over the next two years. Probably not going to hold these to expiration. Never do. Hopefully they're worth nothing and I lose all my money. But if we look in here, all the open interest is sitting at the $45 put. Again, January 2026, 20, select put, out of the money. It's all sitting in that $45 range. So when I'm looking at this for January 2026, that's the option chain that I'm looking at. And let me just make sure I got the right one. Uh, 45, yep, okay. And so we got 40, January 2026, 40, 45. Price per option, I'm just going with what it is today because I, do I, I don't own 2026s yet. I have 2025, but I'm looking to get some insurance probably today on some of these. I don't know if I'll do 100 contracts. I might do a little bit less, maybe like 50. Um, but I want I want some insurance. So I've manually set this for the um, stock price range because I want to show kind of worst case scenarios and what happens if this thing goes up. If this goes up, you lose all your money and you lose it quick. So let's just be real here. Um, the stock right now, as of this, was 75.69. Again, looks like it's in a great breakout breakdown zone. But if this thing if this thing goes up or treads here, uh, by the end of this year, you'll have lost 50% of your money if it's just sideways. So again, hedge. We want to lose this money. Keep that in mind. Now, if we don't lose this money, this is two years worth of range here. If this company gets crushed at any point, if it drops down to the 200 moving average, first real area of support, 30% down, what do we make? And that, what number was that again? Uh, 53. Okay, let's go to 53. So not a lot, not a lot of money here. Now some, don't get me wrong, like let's say by the end of this year, it drops down to like the 53 range. We make 100% return. So roughly a little bit less, 91%. But that's off of a move that is 32% down. So that's a 3Xer. That's a 3-bagger. But this isn't made for that. This play is not for that. This isn't something I want to make money off of. I'm not looking for a 30% down move so I can make a bunch of money and then and then uh, sell out of it. I This is for catastrophe, okay? This is for things have really melted down. It's not good. Now, in that case, 48 is pretty easy. And I would actually even argue that we will test down, like I said, to the 39, between 39 and 34 range. I think 39 to 34 is more accurate. If we enter any kind of like major economic recession, that's probably gonna be the bottom. So 39 to 34, now these numbers start to look better. Um, off of a 48% down move a year, like by the end of the year, by the end of the year, to 39, that first target is a 250% move. I've got 33,250 plus my original 13,300. So I'm rocking almost you know $47,000 right now. But if we get down to that 33, then it's 377% off of a 56 downward move. So that's that's that leaves me with $64,000 roughly. Now, and that's with this incredibly depressed. So you've taken a small amount of money and you've made almost 400% off of it. So it beats having cash. And again, for me, this thirteen or $13,000 is like not even close to a percent of my portfolio. It's like 
5% of my portfolio, something like that. So this is nothing for me. This is dust, especially when I made 700% last year. So for this to happen, I, I like this is this is just free money. And again, ideally, I would get up to like at least 100, 200 of these. And if we got down to the 33 range, like by December, I would have I'd make $121,000, which is good money, right? Like that's a good yearly income for an insurance fund that allows you to be able to, let's say the market is incredibly depressed a year from now because of stuff that was unforeseen or that was foreseen and people are finally acknowledging it. That will buy you a lot if your favorite things are down 80, 90%. And let's say at that point you're buying 2027 20, January, you know, January leaps for long. That gives you years to recover and you haven't used a lot of your money and you're buying on the way low. Can you imagine what would happen to the markets if, let's say that the markets really get destroyed, Tesla's under $100, um, maybe in the 80s, it could do that. And and because you hedged, you're able to pick up, you know, $100, $125,000 worth of Tesla on the lows. Um, these are the kind of things you want to think about with a small amount of your money, less than, you know, 5% or less. Now, this thing will not, it's, Normally, what you want to do when you're in a hedging strategy, you're looking to hedge with something that's kind of like equal volatility. My This is not my play. <laughs> my, my stuff is incredibly asymmetric to the upside. Um, but these two plays that I'm giving you today, they are not like incredibly asymmetric to the upside or the down normally. But again, it's about a safety play. It's about only making money if things are really falling apart. So that's the gist here. That's kind of what I'm looking at at Best Buy. I also think that Best Buy could fail in the next couple of years or get really close to it. It is a bed, bath, and beyond. It is near the end of its lifespan. So like, let's say that it really had an economic catastrophe and started to get beat up. You could see this thing go down 92% from where it's at. If, this, if, we, if we have a recession and this company's really rolling over, it could just get destroyed. Now, let's look at what that looks like, right? Let's let's look now between the 33 and the $10 range. And heck, what if the company fails? I mean, you get full payout. So let's look at that too. So, 33, let's let's go out 2 years now because again, we're we're saying we're giving this time for it to fail or for the company just to really get destroyed, closing stores, just trying to survive. And again, it, it would be hard to fail. They could close a lot of stores and probably survive a while. But let's just look at the numbers, right? Let's just look if they overshoot. and Because we don't know. We're This is a hedge. Maybe things get really bad. And if they got really bad, this company will hurt. So 33 to 11, that's like down here. So 33, even two years out, you would be up 350% when it's down 56. So again, that theta decay has worn down some of our profits. But that's still not bad. Now... Let's say that the market really gets destroyed. This thing goes down to $12 a share. Off of an 84% downside move, you have an asymmetric gain of 1,141%. And so you have $330,000 in this case. Now, let's say that the economy has just been destroyed. The world is falling apart. It's like safe, but unemployment is high. Maybe there's war with China. The, the bad stuff has happened. Or this company just gave up and just started to fall apart and nobody cares anymore. If this thing went down and failed two years from now, just failed, you would make 1,600% in gains off of a 100% downside move. You would have over $450,000 roughly. So again, this is the OSHIB money, right? This is the this is the insurance plan. It's not You don't want to make money off of a hedge. You want to lose it all. But this is how you do it, guys. This is how you do it. You find companies that suffer during economic downturns. And Best Buy, as we saw, suffered. Let me go back over here. They suffered a 70% de decrease. Even though they were very strong at the time and Amazon hadn't really started to crush them, they suffered. And then because Amazon started to crush them, for years later they started to suffer. So this, there's definitely downside risk here. And if you never go to Best Buy anymore or you never buy anything there then you're part of the problem and one of the reasons this company is going to die. So just keep that in mind. Next, let's move to Starbucks here and talk about that one. Hopefully I don't get audio lag at the end. I think I've fixed all my issues, but if it does, I'm going to have to do this again and it's going to drive me nuts. So, um, all right, yeah, let's see here. What do we got? Nope, nope, I need it. 
let's go to, I gotta find Starbies here. One second, Starbies, 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 Starbies. Starbies. There we go, Starbies. All right, so there's something I wanna talk about here. So, Starbucks, over 6,500 Chinese location. They're shooting for like 10 or 11,000 here soon. They're building up like crazy in China. And if you looked at their last earnings report, they're kind of hurting overseas. I warned about this. I've been looking at this play for a while. Um, I just never thought this was a good idea. And uh, now we're going to go into why. So let's uh, let's zoom in here a little bit. Yeah, okay. So I'm not going to do the chart here. We'll look at that in the next screen. All I wanted to point out is what happened in 2008 because I had a good visual for this. People don't buy $5 coffee <laughs> in Great Recessions. Um, or if, again, it, like let's say unemployment's increased, we're at war, things are scary, people are scared, they're not buying $5 coffee. So last time in a year, roughly, they lost 82% of their value because of that. And that was before they had high international exposure in places like China. One third of their business right now is overseas. And international markets get destroyed during a downturn. Now, this last earnings, I think some people played it off as not so much a China issue, but also um, boycotts from parts of uh, the Middle East because of some perceived political stuff with Starbucks and Israel. I don't know. Like, there's always something, right? So always some narrative. I don't think it was just that. I think that I think internationally they're in emerging markets they're seeing some stress especially in a number of them including china now oh uh, people stop doing oh yeah uh, why did it drop so hard back in 2008 people stopped drinking coffee uh here's an article from business today uh it says starbucks coffee took a hit during the economic slowdown of 2008 as customers opted for cheaper options for their everyday coffee Starbucks was forced to shut 600 shops that were not making profit. By March 30th of 2008, its profit had fallen 28% compared to the same period in 2007, November 9th, 2019. So again, people don't buy $5 coffee when the world comes to an end. Also, Starbucks has a lot of China-related risk, with it being the second largest market that Starbucks is in, uh, with over 6,300 stores. Again, they're trying to get to 11,000 or something by, I think it's the end of this year. I have to double check some of the math or, or some of the info, but it's not good. It's not a good situation. Um, and in making roughly up 20% of the revenues, that was as of writing this, it's probably, well, it might be the same because they're losing some. Anyway, it's that's not great though. That's one fifth of your revenue stream and an area where I believe the economy is falling apart, like literally Great Depression era stuff. Um, and I'm, I watch this other video when I come up with my China stuff, it's gonna blow your mind. Uh, their exposure isn't just China either. Roughly one third of their stores are international after a big push to increase their international footprint over the last decade. Great for the last decade, not so great for what might come. Um, in my humble opinion, this will cause them to be weaker in, an econ in a major economic event uh, because countries other than the US are more likely to take a hit because of our world reserve currency status. So I'm just saying having one thirds of your business be international. So we saw them, what, what did we see them fall? What did we see them fall? They fell 83% almost. And this was before they had really strong international risk. This is just with American risk. And we were the world reserve currency back then in the cleanest shirt and the dirty laundry. And we got hurt, but the world got crushed back then. And that would happen again, except amplified because of all the debt that's out there. So this, this could hurt for them. Now we're going to jump out of this. We want to look at Starbucks. We're actually just going to look here at Yearly. Great company. They have, uh, again, just revenue just keeps going up. Uh, netting, $4 billion. You can't hate that. Cash flows are solid. Shares outstanding. They're reducing it. Operating expenses are going up. Don't love that. Don't love their high debt loads as of late. Now, these guys kind of have a money printer because they have this reward like system, and they've got a bunch of money on these accounts. So they hold a lot. Let's see if I have, I don't know if I have any of that under visual stocks. I love this side, by the way. Um, oh, their revenue is going up, but operating expenses are trending a little bit up too. Not the end of the world. Nothing bad here. Um, historical margins haven't are going down. Uh, ratios. I don't know if there's anything I care about here. Estimates. Let's look at estimates. So their estimates are to go up. Um, and I and again, I think there's risk here. As as I showed you, 
They have tons of international exposure. The company's in great shape right now. So as far as buying it for short, I actually think that that's not a bad deal, even though it has been beat up a little bit. Let's look at the stock. Um, you can see where this thing is hanging on our knife's edge. I've got, I'm using a Fibonacci retracement here, going back to their low of 2008. Now, they are finding support on the first Fib level, but it's it's sketchy, man. You look here, and uh, they're hanging on, just barely hanging on. That's why I'm going to be buying some puts, uh, long puts today on this, and I'll show you uh, which ones I'm looking at getting into. Hopefully, I'll be in them before I publish this video because I don't want people front running me. But, um, and again, look at your own. Look at different time frames. Don't follow the stuff I'm doing because this video gets seen by a lot of people and you don't need to do it today. A lot of the times when I publish something like this, people might jump into things because I do it and they don't put any thought into it themselves. They don't use the tools. They don't use the option chain. They don't look at different contracts. They don't look at different dates. They don't examine this on their own to figure out whether this works for them or not. And they just jump into it and that will drive up the price short term, but give it a couple of days and it just goes back what to whatever mean it is. So this is something where I would encourage you to wait, if nothing else, um, and and find your entry. Watch it, find your entry, do your own research. Again, just be smart. I got my little disclaimer down at the bottom now, so I'm not gonna say that every single time. You can read it on your own. Now, again, this is a similar pattern. This looked like they looked, Starbucks looked like they were pulling an Amazon where they were just gonna be okay, right? They were going to be okay. They were going to go up. And it was funny because like this was off of quarterly earnings where they were making it sound like China business is going to be great, even though I didn't really see any of that in the reporting. But that was the perception of that. And the reality, I think, in international markets is quite, the different, or is quite different from what they thought. And again, you can see how this is trending down and not looking great. So, but, but the thing is, let's go back. Let's go back to 2008. Now, again, to be fair on this one, they saw about a 74% drop in a year, and it was a little bit slower. But I would I would say that, okay, so if we do top to bottom, we're looking at potentially not finding support until like the $33 range down to the 28 where this bottom fib is, right? I think that that's a pretty realistic scenario if we have a major economic downturn or like war with China. War with China and what is it, 7,000, 8,000 stores just go poof, along with everyone they were building. Poof, it's China's now. So you got to realize over 20% of their market just disappears overnight. And then other parts of their market that are in Asia could be affected by shipping-related issues and just threats. And that's, that's if we go to war. If we don't go to war and we just have a major economic slowdown, like a major recession in China, which has already started, I'm sorry, it has, they, they hide 93 92%, 93% of their economic data has went poof since the pandemic. So they hide and obfuscate and lie. The CCP is liars about everything. They lie constantly. They're horribly oppressive. They're, they are the Nazis, okay? The CCP is disgusting. Uh, Chinese people, love them. I hope they have some freedom and democracy, but the CCP is evil, um, I won't go into a big diatribe here. I'll save that for my China video. But if, if, if that's right and we have a major economic downturn there, and that, that could bleed into here, and at the very least, it will encapsulate emerging markets. They will be impacted more than we are here. And one-third of their revenue comes from that. So I would argue that if we have a major economic downturn, they're going to feel it big time more so than before because of all that international exposure. And if we get impacted here, holy heck, they'll really get hit. But again, if we just use the basic stuff, let's look at 47 where we find our dot .618. This is normally the time you bounce, the golden retracement zone. And there's a 200 moving average. So that's our top range. That's where we're like, oh, hey, I think it could stop here, right? If, if the world's coming to an end. And we got two years for this to happen. And then we'll say our mid range. So we got 48 for the top. Mid range is around twenty eight. Let's say let's say mid range let's say forty eight, and then like where we start to see support at thirty three, forty eight thirty three. Ultimate bottom, the top of two thousand and eight, fifteen. Let's look at these numbers. Now again, I already pulled this up and I looked under January twenty twenty six and I saw that the all of it was around sixty dollars. So that's what we're sticking to. 
So January 2026, $60 puts. Um, I've thrown in just, you know, 23 grand, 100 contracts at today's pricing. It's currently trading a hair under 93, something like that. So, so that's realistic. And let's go, so let's look out here. Let's, again, if, the, if this thing goes up, we lose all of our money. Probably quicker than the Best Buy one. And this one has the ability to go up quicker. So maybe you step into this one slower because this is a better company than Best Buy. Best Buy is sheet. All right. So, um, again, we lose money, right? But let's look at the top end of that spectrum. If it even takes a year, so let's use that same thing. If it takes a year to get down to that 200 moving average, we've made 457% off of a 48% move. So this is a nine bagger, almost 10x, right, with this. So taking 23,000, if it gets just to what is probably a decent likelihood if we have a major recession or war or anything like that, um, we make we make a lot of money. We have 125K. Again, looks very Best buy -y, very good. And then let's say that this gets much worse. Let's say that this goes to 33. I don't even have this on my low target. Let me fix this real quick. My low target is the previous highs. So let's say like 17, 16. Let's get to that. So let's adjust this here. Recalculate. Okay. So we get to the 40s. We make decent money. Now let's say that things are really bad, but we want to go out a ways. We want to see, because this is, has diminishing returns the further you go out because you lose extrinsic value. At the end of the option, you have intrinsic value. That's all that's left. And that just means the difference between what your strike price was and what it settles at. And so if, <clears throat> if it's at your strike price, you make nothing. If it's under, you make nothing. Or I should say in this case, we're doing puts. So if it's higher, then your strike price, you make nothing. If it's at it, you make nothing. But if you if it's under it, you start to make some profits. Now they're small in the beginning. This is down 38%, but you only made seven. So not super great, but let's go down to that 45%, 45 number, 48 number, 540%, again, a nine bagger, beautiful. What happens if it gets to the 33 range? Uh, off a 65% drop, you have 1,100%. And again, if it happens sooner, you make more money. Um, oh, you know what? Oh, no, no, I need to fix this one. Let me do something real quick. I screwed it up. Again, make sure you run these things yourself. I've got this on a long call. It needs to be a long put. So I'm going to redo it real quick. Um, January 2026, $60. Uh, 100 contracts. We're going to go down to 15. All right, long put bearish. Again, make sure you run these yourself. Long call, bullish, long put, bearish. Those are the two that I focus on. All right, so let's go back. 45, and this won't be too far off. Um, it'll just fix some of the issues going back here. Um, all right, so 45, we have... Uh, yeah, no, it's real close. Um, 540%. That didn't change much. Now let's go down to 33. 33 is 1100%. Again, that didn't change much. Now let's say it gets way down to the bottom because we've had a major economic downturn. Um, we're actually at the highs of 2008. That would be strong support. In fact, it might not even get to the 15s. It's probably better to look at like 17, 16, something like that. Because everybody tries to buy at the bottom. Even when they're scared, they're like, oh, maybe this is a pretty good opportunity. This is a 2008 high. That's like once in a lifetime. And Starbucks isn't going to fail. So let's just be realistic. 30, 33, to, um, 33 to like 17 is probably a good range. So if it got down to 1750, 1,700%, $401,000 off of a $23,000 investment, 19X or roughly. Um, this is great. This is great. Like you got almost a 20 bagger. So again, you take a small amount of your portfolio between this and the Best Buy one, I would be looking at like point, or I'm sorry, 3% of my portfolio or something like that. And during a major, major economic downturn, I've got like, I don't know, <clears throat> Five or five to eight hundred thousand dollars worth of insurance, and I did it with forty-five. So, this is what we this is what we shoot for, guys. Um, we shoot for covering our butts, but at the same time having asymmetric upside. The only way you really lose when you're doing long call options is if the market doesn't do anything at all. 
If it just trades sideways, let's say for a year, two years, because I'm pushing out to January 2026 leaps, if it just trades sideways, you'll lose with options. That's the thing you need to keep in mind. But again, I also have a huge amount of my bet, and I'll just hop over here real quick. I have a huge amount of my bet, not just in options, it's in Bitcoin. And over the next year and a half, I'm not really worried about that. Let's see here, 13% in CLSK, Bitcoin miner. Um, I have an undisclosed amount in a hardware wa wallet of Bitcoin too that I don't talk about, but I have that too. That's like a safety, right? So 13 plus nine for bit farms. So that's 22 plus my SHIB coins. So that's 28% plus Riot. That gets me to 33% plus iBit. That's 34 plus Master, 35% plus um, some FBT. So I'm about 35, 36. Oh, and ETH. Uh, 30, 36 to 37% of my money is in Bitcoin and crypto related investments that historically stand a really good chance of making a bunch of money. So, and I've got TLT. I've got 9% in TLT, which is bonds. So if the market's falling apart, these could double pretty easily. And I get the dividend payout. So, and I've got cash. <laughs> so, so if we have an economic downturn, I'm pretty covered. Uh, even if we get, or even if we get, I should say, sideways chop for the next two years, I'm pretty covered. I've still got asymmetric returns. I'm still making hundreds of percent every year and magnifying my money a lot. So just try and be smart with the way you position. Think about different strategies that people do. Uh, again, like, subscribe. This is 36 minutes. I'm probably going to cut it now. Like, subscribe, uh, ring the bell. Join if you want to support the channel. I probably will do more exclusive content in the future, and at least with um, Starter Pack, and then eventually maybe like early releases of videos to people that do alpha and uh, male and female uh, for the tier. And then anything beyond that is just like you're a badass. And uh, I'm going to try and get some GIFs and some other stuff that that the really badass contributors um, can use uh, in chat. And I'm going to try and do a lot more of that. But it's to help the channel grow. I don't want to do all the editing. I don't want to do the chapters. I don't want to do the thumbnails. I don't want to do any of this crap. <clears throat> I want to I want to do macro fundamentals and TA. And I want to help you give you guys an edge. That's my goal is to give you an edge with educational material. Give you an edge with what's going on in the daily market recap that I'm going to do again today. Uh, that'll be at 3.30. Uh, I'm going to try and do it earlier. Uh, but anyway, yeah, do what you can. Love you guys. I will see you later today. Bye.